Unit 5, Section 1 gives us an introduction to the fundamentals of chemical kinetics. Now, this unit, Unit 5, is going to be the first in a series of units that talks about different facets of chemical reactions. For example, here in a future unit, we'll talk about thermodynamics, which answers the question, will the reaction take place? Is it going to go? And if it does, well, how much heat is associated with that reaction? We'll also talk about equilibrium here in a future section. And that answers the question, how far will the reaction go? Is the reaction going to proceed 100% of the way to completion? Is it only going to go halfway, a third of the way? How far is it going to go? Well, Unit 5 is about kinetics. And this answers the question, how fast will the reaction go? So when we talk about chemical kinetics, we're specifically studying the rates of chemical reactions and the factors that affect those rates of reaction. So as you're probably aware, there are some chemical reactions that take place very quickly, as you can see in the picture here. Here's a picture of something that seems to be on fire almost uh, explosively, a very, very fast reaction. And there are some reactions that we're going to study in this unit that react very quickly, pretty much that fast. On the other hand, there are some reactions that take place very slowly, like we see in this picture, like uh, you have with the rusting of a car. And yes, we are going to talk about those or some of those types of reactions as well and how we can describe those very slow rates of reaction. Now, before we jump into this, though, it's probably good for us to learn about some of the definitions and, and how we actually measure and talk about the rate of reaction. So we're going to look at this balanced equation here. We have 2N2O2, and it decomposes into 2N2O and O2. So we're going to take a look at a graph and as we do that, we're going to focus on the reactant, which is the dinitrogen dioxide. And we're also going to focus on just the dinitrogen monoxide product. For right now, we're going to ignore the oxygen. We'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. So let's take a look at this graph. Now, this graph is a graph of concentration as a function of time. And so notice that the product N2O starts out with a concentration of zero, which you would expect since it's a product. You're not going to have too much of that product starting out. And then as the reaction proceeds, its concentration increases. And notice that the reactant, N2O2, starts out at a fairly high concentration. Looks like it's about 1.7 zero zero moles per liter and then it goes down as time goes on and that's what you would expect as well for a reactant that it would start out with a relatively high concentration and slowly drop as time goes on now what do you notice about the rates of both of those substances well one thing that may seem a bit peculiar about the graph is that both of the curves pretty much look the same. In fact, the only difference is they're going in opposite directions. Essentially, the N2O goes up at pretty much the same rate at which the N2O2 goes down, but they're just opposite in direction. Now, is that a coincidence? Well, I don't think so, because if we take a look at the balanced equation, and we look at the coefficients of those substances. Notice that the coefficient of N2O, which is a 2, is the same as the coefficient for N2O2. It's also a 2. These are equal coefficients. This tells us something about the rates. Whenever you have substances in a balanced equation that have the same coefficient, they're going to have the same rate of reaction. Now, the only difference is if it's a product, well, it's going to go up at that rate. And if it's a reactant, it's going to go down at that same rate. So the balanced equation can tell us some things about the relative rates of reaction. Now, let's take a look at this graph again. And let's just notice or focus in on how the rate of reaction changes as time progresses. 
I want you to notice that for both of these substances, and it doesn't really matter which one we focus on, notice that at the beginning of the reaction, in the case of N2O anyway, it shoots up fairly quickly. And then with every interval after it, it shoots up slower and slower and slower. So we notice that at the beginning of the reaction, the rate is the highest. And then as time goes on, the rate goes down. Now, mathematically speaking, you can take a look at this and say that the slope of the line, or I should say the, the absolute value of the slope of the line, is the highest at the beginning of the reaction. That's the case for the, the reactant as well. It drops the most quickly at the beginning of the reaction, and then, likewise in every interval, it slows down after that. Now let's actually put some numbers to this. Let's determine the rate of change of N2O in the time interval from 0 to 50 seconds. So we're going to take a look at the N2O curve, that's this one here, from 0 to 50 seconds. Now when we measure the rate of a reaction, it's a little different than the rate of a car or a rate of a of an airplane or something like that because the rate of a car for example is the change in distance divided by the change in time well when you have a chemical reaction you don't have a beaker that's literally like sliding across the table that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about rate we're discussing the change in the concentration of the substance over change in time now that's a lot easier to calculate isn't it for n2o all we have is, notice that it went from uh, basically from 0, 0.000 up to 0 0.500 over the course of the first 50 seconds over here. So the way that we calculate that is just 0 0.500 molar minus 0 molar divided by 50 seconds. And so when you key that uh, those numbers into your calculator, you should get an answer of about 1.00 times 10 to the negative second, a molarity per second. Now, you want to have units whenever you talk about the rate of change or the rate of reaction. The unit in a kinetics problem like this should be some sort of concentration unit divided by a unit of time. In this case, we're using molarity, so I use molarity per second. If this were a slower reaction, it might be molarity per minutes, or molarity per hour, or molarity per century, who knows. But either way, it should be some sort of concentration unit divided by time. Now, as you can probably tell, if we just look over the entire 50 second interval, that's probably not the most precise way to determine the rate at the beginning of that reaction because we can probably figure out that at the beginning of the 50 seconds it's going faster and then by the time we get to the end of the 50 seconds it has probably slowed down a little bit. So if you want to use a more precise way of determining the instantaneous rate, that is the rate at a specific moment in time, the way that you would do that is you would take the slope of a tangent line to that curve. So what that means is, let's, say, let's just say for example that you wanted to find the, uh, the rate or the instantaneous rate at, oh let's say, 75 seconds. And so what you would do is you would, in the case of N2O, you'd pinpoint 75 seconds, which is right here as far as I can tell, and then you would draw a tangent line to the curve, and it's a little bit hard for me to do here on the screen, but a tangent line is just a, a line that touches that curve at exactly that one point. And that, I'm not doing a very good job drawing a tangent line, but that's the basic idea there. That's the tangent line at 75 seconds. And you'd find the slope of that line. And the absolute value of that slope is going to be the, the instantaneous rate at that particular moment in time. And you could do that for any time period. If you wanted to, to take a look at, say, 300 seconds, well, you would do the essentially the, the same thing. You take the curve at uh, 300 seconds right there, which is right around that spot right there, and you would draw a tangent line 
and I'm once again not very good at this on the screen, but you get the I well, it's not like I'm following the, the curve, so you get the idea there that we're going to draw a tangent line, and we'd have to find the slope of that. You can probably eyeball that and see that the slope is less, so the rate is going to be lower as you proceed uh, farther in time. That's how you would do that. Let's try another example. We just decided or just calculated that the rate of change of N2O in the time interval from 0 to 50 seconds was 1.00 times 10 to the negative second, a molarity per second. So if that's the case, let's estimate the rate of change of oxygen over the same time interval. Now, we're going to use what we mentioned earlier, and that would be the coefficients. So notice that the mole ratio of N2O to oxygen is 2 to 1. So that tells us that whatever the rate of reaction of N2O is going to be, oxygen is going to be half of that because its coefficient is half that of N2O. So all we have to do to answer the question is figure out whatever half of 1.00 times 10 to the negative 2 molarity per second is. And so that would be 5.00 times 10 to the negative third molarity per second. And so that's all you would have to do for something like this. Now let's try a different question. Let's estimate the rate of change for N2O2 over that same 50 second time interval. Well, notice that this time the coefficients are the same. It's a 2 to 2 ratio. So whatever the the, the rate of N2O was, guess what? N2O, or N2O2, is going to be the same. So it would also be 1.00 times 10 to the negative 2 molarity per second. And so you could use the coefficients of, of the balanced equation as a ratio to determine the relative rates of reaction of the different substances. Now just so you know, you might notice that all the rates that we've looked at so far are positive values. Sometimes, I know in uh, physics, they say if you're going, uh, if, if the value is increasing, we say the rate is positive, and if it's uh, going backwards, we say the rate is uh, negative. That's not the case here in chemistry. We don't worry about that. Just as uh, by convention, we say that all rates are positive. So we wouldn't say that this is a negative rate or anything like that. It's like in your car speedometer, if you, uh, if you put it into reverse and you start driving, you're still proceeding at a positive rate. We're not going to worry about the negative rate. No one's going to say you're going a negative 50 kilometers per hour. That's not really how it works. Now, let's wrap up this first section by talking about four ways to speed up a chemical reaction. Now, usually when we're in the lab, we are thinking about making a reaction go faster. Well, likewise, if you were to do the opposite of things, you would slow down the reaction. So these are the four factors that affect the rate. The first way is to change the temperature. Now we know this works because when you raise the temperature, you're causing the molecules to move faster. And when molecules move faster, they're going to collide more often. And when they do collide, they're going to collide with more force. And so that's one of the uh, key, in fact, probably the easiest way to make a reaction go faster is to raise the temperature. Um, generally, in, in industry, we have the rule of thumb that says approximately for every 10 degrees Celsius that you increase the temperature, it causes the rate of a typical reaction to double. And that's not the case all the time, but that's just a rule of thumb that sometimes we, we think about. But think about how that works on a molecular level. You know, faster molecules, more collisions, and they react with more force, or they collide with more force. So you have a better chance of an effective collision that's going to create a, a chemical reaction. Another thing that you can do is increase the concentration. We'll talk more about this in an upcoming video. Now, when you increase the concentration, what you're uh, doing is you're causing the, uh, the molecules that are potentially going to react to be packed closer to each other. So instead of being you know, farther apart and they collide less frequently, when they're smashed closer to each other, they're going to collide more frequently. So you'll have a better chance 
of a faster chemical reaction. Now, this would be the case in a solution, increasing the concentration. If we're talking about uh, gases, we would normally say increase the pressure, wouldn't we? Increasing the pressure of a gas is going to have the same effect as increasing the concentration of a solution. It's really the same thing, we just call it something different. Now a third way to speed up a reaction is to decrease the particle size. Now I think fundamentally or intuitively most of us understand this. If you take a log, a fairly large log, and you try to put that into a fireplace, it's going to take a, a certain amount of time for that log to burn, maybe an hour or two hours, I don't know. If you take that same log and you run that through a wood chipper, and now you have the same amount of wood, but now it's the size of wood chips, it's going to burn much faster, maybe in 10 or 15 minutes. If you take those wood chips and pulverize it down to the consistency of sawdust, now that same amount of wood is going to react or burn much more quickly, perhaps in just a, perhaps a minute or so. If you could somehow take that and get the particle size fine enough, it could actually cause an explosion. And that is something that happens sometimes. If you have uh, grain or perhaps other particles that are very, very fine, very, very small particles, it can actually cause an explosion. Now the reason this works is that if you decrease the particle size, it causes the reactant to have a greater surface area. And so there are literally more spots on the reactants where a reaction can occur. Now in chemistry, we say that that increases the number of active sites. That's just a fancy way of saying you have more spots or more places where a chemical reaction can take place. So decreasing particle size, you know, increasing the surface area, is a very effective way to speed up a reaction. Now let's take a look at the fourth way, which is possibly the first way that some of you might have been thinking about, and that's to add a catalyst. Now we'll talk more about catalysts later on in this unit, but a catalyst is pretty neat because it speeds up a reaction without being consumed. And so it's this is something that almost seems too good to be true. You put a catalyst into a reaction, it speeds up the reaction, but it, it never gets used up. And so you can keep recycling it over and over, which is one of the, the neat things about using a catalyst. Now, the way this works is a catalyst will lower the activation energy of a reaction. We'll talk more about what that means here in an upcoming uh, video. But essentially what's happening is catalysts provide a lower energy alternate pathway for the reaction. And when you have a lower energy pathway, that means more molecules are going to be able to attain that lower energy. Maybe the uncatalyzed reaction would have had a very high energy threshold in order to react. And maybe not many molecules would be able to attain that threshold. Well, since you have a lower energy alternate pathway, a whole lot of molecules will be able to attain that, and that's going to cause the reaction to go faster. So these are the four ways that you need to know about to speed up a reaction. Now raise the temperature, uh, raise the concentration, that's kind of the same thing as increasing the pressure, decrease the particle size, and add a catalyst. I hope you've learned something about the fundamentals of chemical kinetics. Hope you smashed that thumbs up button. My name is Jeremy Krug, and I hope to see you in my next video about chemical kinetics as we move forward with Unit 5 in AP Chemistry.